So let me share my screen and get my presentation up. Can everybody see this okay? Yes. Great. So my name is Michelle Rogers Estebel. I was working at Delhi as the manager of online learning, and then I just actually recently left to become the director of the Teaching Learning and Technology Center at SUNY Oneonta. So, um, so now I'm out here at uh, SUNY Oneonta. I might put my email on here, and you're very welcome to contact me with any questions, or um, if you want to brainstorm or you have ideas, things like that, then um, I'm always available to talk about um, using apps and education. So um, I just wanted to do a quick overview. Um, first of all, uh, BYOD apps it stands for bring your own device. The reality is every single student in your classroom has their own phone, and I'm not sure the percentage, but it's fairly high. I think around at least 80% of them are probably smartphones, which means they can download apps, they can access the internet, and they can do um, various things and editing things on those phones. So if all your students are bringing apps to your classrooms anyway, you might as well be getting them to use them for what you're doing in the classroom and for projects. Um, Training time, students know how to use their own devices, so it's better if they're using their own versus you bring in, say, a set of iPads or something, and then you have to do all the training where on their own devices, they know how to install apps, they know how to do a lot of basic things, and they may already know how to do um, some basic functions like editing photos or editing video, things like this. So you save yourself support and training time by having the students just use their own devices. Um, as for the apps out there, there are some apps that are specific to certain types of phones, say um, a Galaxy or to, uh, to an iPhone, but a lot of apps are also BYOD, basically any device. And they're free or they're low cost, and they can do a lot of really fun things. We'll go through um, a few examples in a bit. And innovation. Uh, the reality is your modern student is looking for a more innovative learning experience and the more that they can use technology in the classroom or it's used in what they're doing I think we find that student engagement goes up and student satisfaction goes up um, it's phones can basically be used as what I would call a multimedia production device um, meaning that they can take photos, they can take video, they can write text or papers, they can put together presentations um, and I'll go through a bunch of examples again later about how, how those can be used in classroom projects. Um, they can do interactive reports. They can share things with each other within a group, um, send things to each other, or use online cloud storage like Dropbox and Box to put files and then share them with each other. So it's very easy for them to share things. That if someone just took a photo and they want to give it to the student next to them to put into a presentation that the other student is making on their iPad or their phone, then they can easily just quickly send that over. And, and so it's, it allows for really good collaboration and I think a lot of creativity because while I am going to list some specific, um, specific apps it doesn't mean that you are required to only use those apps. There are many, and for every type of app out there, there's probably two or three others just like it. Um, if you want to do uh, a mapping tool, there's Poplet and there's MindMeister, but there's a whole lot of other ones, and you can go and download them all and test them out and find the ones that you think are best to recommend to your students. Is there any questions so far? Do I still have everyone on board? Yeah, okay, great. I'll go back to sharing again. Okay. Um, I think one of the things uh, I've seen done in the past and here, and I'll show a website from when I worked in, I worked in the Middle East at the Higher Colleges of Technology before I went to SUNY Delhi. And at, um, and, and at the Higher Colleges of Technology, or HCT, <clears throat> they were using iPads in all the classrooms. So, there was a focus on iPad apps there and not so much kind of bring your own device apps, apps that'll work on any phone. So I've tried to adjust this presentation towards apps that'll work on any phone. However, I would like to show some examples later on about the kinds of things that teachers were doing with students in the classroom at ACT using iPads. There are iPads I know at the Delhi Library that can be, I think there's one or two that can be checked out 
and could be used in the classroom if a couple students didn't have a smart device. So there's, you know, you could make up groups, make sure at least most of the kids have them, and maybe the others could go get that iPad to help them out. Um, so multimedia projects, I think uh, one is there's a lot of presenter tools out there. So Prezi, I, I really like. There's PowerPoint, Keynote, there's Evernote, and CBB stands for Creative Book Builder. Um, all of these can be used for the student to put together a presentation. If they had to do a presentation in class, they can put it together right on their phone or their iPad. Um, so included with that is photo editing. Now, I really like Be Funky. I think it's my currently my favorite photo editing tool. Um, you can add text and you can do all these fun things with the photos. And um, Sketch is a really good one as too as well, which um, last I checked was free. Occasionally these are free and then they start to charge. So um, I've tried to list free ones. Over time though, they may or may not remain free. Um, <clears throat> So students can take a photo and then they can add it to the presentation right on the same device that they're working on. Video editing, there's Lumify, you can do video editing YouTube, and a lot of devices have their own, like there's iMovie on iPhones. Um, I think it's media something on, um, on, uh, on other types of phones. So there's, most phones have some type of just basic core app that allows you to edit the video that you have, but then you can also download video editing tools like Lumify that would allow you to do a whole lot more as well. Um, digital whiteboards, so these are tools that allow you to do kind of lecture capture. So explain everything is very popular with teachers. You can add a photo and you can write over it and, and it lets you annotate and kind of an interactive whiteboard and you can record it as you go and create these sort of interactive whiteboard lectures that you can then give. Students could use this to talk about a photo or an image or some sort of information and then make a video out of that lecture capture to put into their presentation. Dossary is another really good um, digital whiteboard and lecture capturing tool. So is EduCreations and ScreenChomp. Um, I'll give a link later to a blog post I did where I reviewed these. Personally, I really like Dossary. It was my favorite, but a lot of people go to explain everything. I think, again, download them, test them out, decide the one you like best, and recommend that to your students. You want to recommend to your students apps that you could help them if they start to have issues with, although most of these tend to be fairly intuitive use, I think, particularly for students who are used to editing um, media on their phones and, and their iPads. Um, for digital posters, I really like ThingLink. Um, it's, a, it's really cool. You can take these images and do these really interactive um, kind of presentations with them where you can add video and text and hyperlinking and all this other stuff to an image. For example, I saw one done on uh, a cell, like a cell in the human body, and then it had all the parts of the cell, and then there were videos um, linked to each of the parts of the cell that were labeled and definitions labeled, and, and the student could go through and sort of interactively touch different parts of the cell and learn about it or see videos about it. And it was just really cool way to provide a, a kind of interactive multimedia lecture. Um, Glockster is a great uh, digital poster project um, tool, as is Padlet. So um, one example I can give is that at Delhi, um, Lauren, who teaches biology, had her students do a digital poster this term. And in the past, what she would do is at the end of the class, the students had to do this sort of paper-based poster, kind of a typical presentation poster you do in a lot of science classes, and they had to paste on, you know, cut and paste on all this stuff that they'd done, and she just decided she was going to have them do digital posters. So she gave them all the tools and had them do digital posters. I'm not sure how that went. Do you know, John, how that went, that project? how that turned out for her? I actually spoke to her before she had anyone hand anything in, so I'm not sure how it went. Okay, I'd be curious now to find out how that went and how, and how it was received by the students. Um, hopefully, by the next time I give this presentation, I'll, I'll have that kind of information. Um, and I know that Catherine Dezer, also in liberal arts and sciences, about a year ago started having her students do um, these sort of uh, video projects on a topic in her course, and they had to create a video about the topic that was given to them, and and that's gone. I know, I know from speaking to her that went very well, and the students received it very well. And there was very good um, engagement and um, sort of student satisfaction from having a, a project like that. 
in the classroom versus just submitting a research paper. And you know, students write research papers in so many classes, they think they get really excited when a class has them do something a little bit different. Um, so mapping tools, Poplet um, is quite popular. The nursing division I know at Delhi is using it extensively. MindMeister is kind of my favorite, although I think Poplet, Poplet does have a free version. I'm not sure if MindMeister does. I would need to check again. Um, storage and sharing. So there's a lot of cloud storage um, tools that you can use. They have a certain, they have limits on the free version, uh, but I, I have, well, I have an account at each and then I sort of shift around to get the most out of all the free, uh, free um, storage. So there's Box, Dropbox, and Google Drive. There's also OneDrive um, for people with 365 accounts, which Delhi does have. So you can use that as well. Although Box, Dropbox, and Google Drive allow, very easily allow you to upload something, a picture, a video, um, something you've, paper, a presentation, something you've done um, on your iPad or your phone or whatever device you're using and that you kind of create something you can export. So like in Poplet, you make a, um, a mind map, you can export it as a PDF or as some sort of visual tool and then you can upload that to Box, Dropbox, Google Drive and then send the link to people in your group, like for example, if you're working in a group, so that someone else can then add that image to a presentation or a digital poster that they're putting together for the group. So um, I think the storage and sharing is really essential in order to have that kind of collaboration and sharing between team members on different group projects. And then there's the annotation, there's new annotate, and I really like, it's called Meta Moj, Moji Note. Um, it's my favorite note-taking tool, um, although Evernote is really good too. I really like Evernote, and Evernote can be opened on a computer browser and on almost every single device out there. Like it's one of the most, I think, BYOD apps available. Other apps that you could try, um, here's this long list of ones, and I've put them into a file handout, which I put in, I put the link to the handout in the chat window, and I'll just kind of go out and open that now. Let me see. Well, this is if I do a longer training, I do and have everyone do an activity. Let me share something else. All right, can you see this handout? Yes. So in the chat window, you'll see that I put this hand, the link to this so you can download it from Box. And that's the example I, you know, I wanted to show is that I've used Box, which is one of those um, storage, cloud storage uh, tools you can use. I loaded this handout in there and then I just, you click, right click on it and you say share and it gives you a link and then you hand that to people and they can download it. You can email it to them or text it to them or however you want and they can easily get that file then on their own uh, device. So that is the way that students in a group would sort of share devices between each other. Um, one of the things I put on here was this website. So at the Higher Colleges of Technology, we implemented iPads across all 17 campuses across the country. On my campus, we implemented 800 iPads to first-year students in three months. Every single teacher was required to teach using an iPad, and all the students had iPads. Um, it was a massive undertaking. <laughs> and what came out of it was these really innovative um, approaches to teaching and learning, where teachers were really substituting new ways of doing things in the classroom using these smart devices. Um, and and a colleague and I, we got together and we interviewed um, several of the teachers and then we interviewed them for, um, for basically their, their curricular approach. Like what app did you use and also how did you apply it in the classroom and how did you use it with um, students? So um, let me just see if I can find one different. Like here's someone who used Nearpod and Creative Book Builder for reading to improve reading comprehension. It was in an ESL level two course. And so you'll see here there's like the sort of all these basic informations. There's a description and then there's also a lesson plan and other notes about how they used it. So I think that if you're interested in, in doing something like this in your class, talk to Catherine Dessert, talk to Lauren, but also come to websites like this and see how teachers are using them and they'll list out their 
their lesson plans, and I think that um, it can give you a lot of ideas about what you might do in your own classroom. Um, there's some other apps on here, the live whiteboards, the original blog post link is here, um, digital posters, comparison review, when, when I was still at Delhi, I had Erica do a rubric comparing different digital posters that could be used, um, digital poster apps that could be used for these kind of projects in the classroom, and it's at the, um, the Callis Center's blog, so I put the link to that. And ADA apps as well, for people who are interested in sort of ADA and universal access, there's um, a blog post on that. Here is the recommended apps for education. These are just basics, and again, there's so many more, but I just sort of put basic ones that I've really liked or I've seen used very well in the classroom. I also put reviews on some apps uh, down below. You'll see quite a few. Here. Go um, so now I kind of what I want to do is I want to open this up to sort of discuss like if you you know tell me what kind of class you have what you're thinking about doing and then maybe I can help brainstorm with you or answer questions and kind of give you you know help you get some ideas about what you might want to do Michelle I actually have a question okay um, in history which is what I teach Part of the problem is we have massive amounts of information, uh, usually read in the textbook. And I'm wondering is if there would be a way to somehow make that easier or more interesting or something using technology. Because the number one complaint that I have about my courses is there's so much information hard to know what's important. I'm wondering if there's a way I could help with that somehow. I know that there are some apps that are history timelines, like interactive history timelines, and I've seen some that are sort of fun quizzes, like when was this invented or when did this happen. Um, I think that could be quite interesting to set up something along those lines where they go in and there's this, this kind of interactive look at a history timeline that's very visual and graphic and, and maybe kind of like a game. That's cool. Um, that would be my suggestion for history. Um, there are also probably videos. I'm assuming there's lots of videos online about various things, and maybe you could make a sort of online interactive, like ThingLink. I mean, you could use ThingLink, and then maybe it's a it's a initially. And if you go to the ThingLink website, you'll see it can be a picture of anything, and then you basically add all the interactive resources. So you might get um, a timeline of World War II, let's say, and then you go in and you start adding, well, I'm going to add a video to this point on the timeline, and I'm going to add a definition to this, and I'm going to add a link to a newspaper article here, and then it's this very interactive and visual multimedia presentation on the topic, and they can click around on different areas and see the stuff that you've put. That would oh, that, that's cool. Actually, I, I, that's a great idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Sarah, Loretta? Oh, did I unmute? I did. Yeah, I, you know, I really didn't have a lot of ideas right here. I was, I guess, looking to you, Michelle, to give me some <laughs> ideas. I'm, I teach only online. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't really, it's, I don't know, I guess there's a bring your own device to some extent. But um, honestly, the course, this what was a good you time. Talk? Pardon? What topics do you teach? I teach computer fundamentals, mm -hmm. and I also teach computer, principles of computer security. Okay. But I'm an instructional designer most of the time, so right. I work with faculty and. I mean, um, I think um, in a case like that, there's a lot of videos and um, interactive multimedia presentations online already made about, particularly security in computers. Yes. And, and you could certainly um, utilize that kind of stuff, but also do your students, I mean, do they do assignments in the class? Do they submit papers or a presentation or how, do, how are they graded? Yes, absolutely. And, and they use technology to submit their presentations. So they're, they're given yeah. of several different kinds. And so what you could do is you could probably highlight that you want them to um, submit a more interactive presentation, you could ask them to use something like Glockster or use ThingLink and say, I want you to make an, a sort of multimedia interactive presentation. And it's good to have a rubric in these cases so they're clear on what's expected of them, because otherwise you can get all kinds of crazy stuff um, if you kind of leave it wild, wild west. So, you know, I, 
I think um, I should have brought it actually. I had an example rubric, and I didn't think to bring it today. If you email me, then I could um, send it. And it was for a course I took where we had to do a multimedia um, video kind of lecture presentation. But the rubric was really good because it said, I expect to see this many photos or I need to see the video needs to be this long and it should have text and and video and photos in it. and it sort of it really clarified for us like you know what the teacher would expect to see in that so that we knew kind of what to put together. Sure, sure, absolutely. Sarah? Okay, let me read this real quick. Ooh, social psychology, you can have a lot of fun with that, I think. Um, personally, I would, I would tell you to have them make a poster and not a PowerPoint. Um, I've listed PowerPoint as an app that can be used. Um, however, I do tend to try and steer people towards doing something a little bit more multimedia and PowerPoint can be multimedia, but usually what students do is they put a couple images and a bunch of bullet points and that's it. And then it's, you know, not very, um, not very interesting for anybody. Uh, so I would actually suggest telling them, look, you can choose a digital poster box or thing link um, or Padlet. There's three right there that you can tell them they can use any one of those three. And tell them it has to be multimedia and it needs to have some interactivity and um, give them a rubric sort of on what's expected. Maybe you want to see one short video about whatever topic they're discussing and maybe a link to a web resource and maybe um, some text and information about it or history or timeline or whatever. Um, uh, I know psychology courses I've taken, There's it depends on kind of what you're discussing, but for example, when I took educational psychology, we had a thing where we each had to take on the role of a famous um, educational psychologist and then we had to do a presentation based on how they would teach and so you know depending on what you're going to do in the class and what kind of role you're going to have them take on or what you're going to have them sort of research and discuss they could make some very cool uh, digital posters and I think if you do PowerPoint you'll probably end up feeling a bit disappointed in what they give you versus if you have them use some of these other tools you'll get something a lot more interesting um, um, and, and a bit more um, creative from them. So um, anyway Sarah yeah just to wrap up I would think um, the digital poster you said which apps and I think the digital posters in that case because you can add video and text and photos that they've edited and you can put all these things together in this kind of cool multimedia presentation. So um, I would lean towards those and, and tell them no PowerPoint personally. <laughs> Any other questions? I just wanted to comment. I had really good luck with the pictographs or pictocharts for my um, yes my computer fundamentals class. They really enjoy doing that too. Yep. And I, I got the same results that I would get from an essay or yes. a PowerPoint. If I, if I allow them to do a PowerPoint, I make them take it a step further and narrate. Yeah, I mean, at least narration. PowerPoints can just be some bullet points, and then you don't really know how much they actually learned where um, in a digital poster, if they really have to create a timeline or do a history of someone's life or whatever it is that they're doing, um, they have to put more information in there, I think, and they have to go out and find more resources, and um, I just feel like it's easier to grade. Uh, and you can take aspects from a paper, like if they normally write a research paper or they were doing a paper poster, um, for example, spelling should still be something that they're graded on. They should still be spell checking, and they should still be referencing things and putting their sources and references. and. Um, Things like that. So those kinds of things would come straight from the rubric of a research paper or classroom poster into this one. And then you would just add in components of like, I'd like to see at least one video and I'd like you to, and maybe, and something that's really great and I really like is if you tell the student they have to make a little lecture on the topic, maybe some short three minute introduction to this person. So in the example of educational psychologists, maybe I would take my phone and video myself 
talking about the psychologist and some of his major accomplishments and works and um, something short, like a two-minute introduction to the topic, and then you would have him have text and um, and maybe photos and images online, things like this. So yeah, I there's a lot you can do with it, and I think the grading rubric is the key to the quality in the end. Is they they want to know what you'll be expecting to see, but you can make that like obviously each one will be different because they're creating something quite unique. Um, but you can still say, I want to see at least one video. Now how that video looks, and then you should let them know, does that video, can that be a video they find online or is that a video they make themselves using, say, explain everything to do some sort of lecture capture? Um, so, you know, maybe you have them find a video online about the person and make a little introduction themselves that they also add. So then it would be two videos and very clear, like one is one that you have made and one is one that you found online. So, I mean, I think that the rubric is really important for the students to understand exactly what will be expected and what you expect to see on there. And it also will improve the quality and make it easier for you to grade as well. Any other questions? Well, this was really great, you guys. Thanks for coming to my presentation. And um, again, my email, uh, let me just type it into this chat box real quick for you. <clears throat> so feel free to contact me anytime. And um, I love to brainstorm with people about stuff like this. I think students love it, and I love to see it done in the classroom. And there are teachers starting to do this with a lot of success. And so, like I said, talk to Catherine Dezer, talk to um, Lauren in the biology department. They can tell you how they've set it up. They can share their grading rubrics, and um, it'll just, I think, give you a great springboard. <clears throat>